Hello. Well, my subscribers made it clear that this lovely old Scantic VCR LP machine is the next machine that I should work on. Uh, and anyway, I need to get it out of the way. It's a Philips N1700 clone. Uh, but time's a bit against me. Um, I have a lot of other machines to work on, uh, so I'll have to get this done quite quickly. So it's going to be a bit of a frantic Scantic. Uh, let's get stuck in and see if we can fix this thing in one evening. At long last, we get to play with this 1700. I have a tape, but we're going to be some way before we get to try that yet, because we need to sort out the transport on here. The belts will certainly be knackered, and it'll certainly need some lubrication, I think. Let's have a quick look at the deck. Nice feature of these is how easy it is to take the uh, cassette carriage off. Like that. You just push this thing down and it goes into this slot here. Right, before I spend too much time on it, I'd better check that those heads are intact. So I have a small, one of these little times 10 microscopes here, and it's just the thing. The plan is to get it so that you can see the head tip glisten, and then you can see if it's contaminated or damaged. Maybe I'll try and get a shot for, of this on a microscope later and, and share it with you. Some very slight contamination, but nothing of consequence. That is pretty good, that one. Swing it around to the other one. Again, some very slight contamination. I think I'll give them a quick clean before I start. Head cleaner sticks. These are my head cleaner sticks. They're really rather hard to get now. Right, those heads look good. Clean a little bit of the rest of the tape path. Nothing looks that badly contaminated. I have found this guide here to be particularly important. That's a large um, guide that just sits, when it's in the off position, just sits here and it's very important that that one is spotlessly clean. This is the erase head, so you might say don't care about that, but I do because it's still in the tape path and it has a, had a little bit of mould on it I think, so it's obviously run the odd mouldy tape from occasion, on occasions. Then this is the capstan, that is extremely grotty, that needs some severe cleaning. This is the audio control head. They can wear a bit. So I'm going to check for ridges. I can just about feel a little bit of wear on that. But part of it might be just that it needs a bit more cleaning. Well, I'd certainly say that's a very serviceable head. There's no severe wear on that one. You can just feel where the top of the tape has been. Right, I'm not going to use my expensive head cleaner sticks for cleaning the capstone. I'll use cheap uh, cotton buds for that one. So here's the capstone. There's a pinch roller. Uh, you probably can't see the pinch rollers because behind the PCB, but we'll move that PCB out of the way in a moment. The capstan appears to be stalled, so the drive belt underneath is probably um, disintegrated and is grabbing onto it. There's a lot of gunge on this capstan. Hmm, it really is quite grim. That would have been seriously affecting the machine's ability to work. It's an unusual capstan design. Most capstans are smooth the whole way along. This has a smooth section in the middle, and then beyond that, uh, a, a kind of a almost like blasted uh, granular sort of uh, feel. But that is normal. That is the way they're supposed to be. Oh yeah, I can just about rotate the capstan. That helps. There's a lot of gunge on that. Lots of isopropyl alcohol required. 
Right, now let's do the um, pinch roller. What I'm going to do is pull this up. There should be a little clip here on this PCB, and there's not, so that's obviously been lost at some point. This is my light to hold that open. So here's the uh, pinch roller. Doesn't seem to be in bad condition, that one. Right. Now the mechanism itself. All appears to be okay. This is a little grubby, but serviceable, I suspect. Loading ring. Might need a drop of oil. I think I'll do that. Actually, I'll use um, I'll use silicone grease for that. Though I need to be careful; I don't get it onto the head drum. I just have to clean up afterwards. have to clean it off the bottom of the drum. Can't allow grease to sit on the drum. Now you need to keep this away from the head tips. You see I'm turning this to keep the cotton buds away from the head tips. They just don't mix. You need to find a way to secure that. I'll have to get one of the little plastic um, pins that fits in that circuit board. Let me show you a little bit here as well. You've got plug-in panels here. This for example is the head servo and I think that's the capstan servo. Uh, what is it? Tape, tape servo. Yeah, that's capstan servo. Uh, actually somebody's asked me to test one of those later so they'll probably send me a spare one of, or send me one of those to test in his machine. Make sure they're all plugged in cleanly. When you push it down, sometimes they can catch on this. This one could catch on there. You need to be a bit careful. On this, the 1700, this has got um, a worm drive in the uh, loading motor. The earlier 1502, some of them have got this arrangement. Some of them have got uh, an arrangement that includes uh, a plastic gearbox, and that's prone to failure. Right, let's look underneath. No user, user serviceable parts inside. Well, there will be today. Sometimes there are screws in here. I see we have one of those screws. Right, you depress those and then out it comes finger in here, push down on those springs. So we have the uh, capstan and its uh, normal cross section belt. You have the head drum with its flat belt which is not the easiest thing in the world to change. Uh, a belt out here to the tape counter um, and this one here is for the real drive. So, though all the belts are in place, I'm fairly sure they'll need replacing. This one certainly will, before we even start. I mean, you can feel it's sloppy. So we have to take this one off. It comes off easily. But putting the new one on is hard. So that feels really horrible. That's gone all gooey and stretchy. Let's go and find a replacement to that one. I have a packet here marked N1502 N1700 drum belt. And the part number. Excellent. Oh, 
Oh, very good. So we'll put one of them in. So my replacement belt is wider, but that doesn't matter. Uh, it's clearly got a bit more twang to it. Now, installing this is maddeningly hard because you have to get it around this pulley here on the other side of this motor. Well, how the heck are you supposed to do that? I find the best thing to do is to slacken off these screws but not necessarily take them completely off. Or rather slacken off the bracket but not take it completely off. Okay, now with that um, pulled out we can kind of get in there and connect this large pulley underneath right I've got that belt around the motor pulley by the way I've known these motors fail they can squeal Right, that's okay, but I'm not going to fit that yet because I've got to deal with this belt here, which is the capstan belt. This is a wonderful thing. That is a sensor for this magnet, but if you take that off, you'll find that Basically, what it is, is a small mono audio cassette head on that sensor for the magnet. So that's what they've used, which is just wonderful. They obviously had a production line set up for cheap mono audio cassette heads. So uh, that's what they used. Right, this belt, you know, is clearly gone. Let's find a replacement for that one. Okay, so I have a belt here which is really not as thick as the belt I'd like to use, but it looks about the right length. So I think I'll uh, install that for now, and hopefully that will work well enough. Uh, and then I'll order a belt closer to the original later. There's a brush here, which... Uh, I don't know why, why it's there. Uh, I guess it's there probably to provide damping rather than to clean the belt. More likely to be damping, I think. Okay, I believe I have that properly fitted on the capstan. Of course, you just can't see what you're doing here. But yes, that's the pulley to the capstan motor. That's working. Now, I'm sure someone will leave me comments saying, oh, you're doing it all wrong. There's a much easier way to change those belts. But I've always found them fiddly. Do wonder how they install them at manufacture, because... Philips have always been a company who have thought hard about making manufacture as easy as possible. They use lots of connectors and plugs and things where other manufacturers at the time would have done soldering. Less so with the original N1500, that wasn't really built for manufacture, but this sort of vintage onwards, they were, lots of plug-in boards and things. So uh, it's surprising that they came up with a design there that was just so hard to build. What are these other belts? This The tape counter one really isn't terribly important, you know, as long as the tape counter goes around we're happy. This is real drive. Actually I don't think that is real drive, you know, I think that one there just goes to, I think that's just a uh, about the servo to check that the head the this the tape is moving. I don't think it drives the 
tape at all. I think that's done by a wheel, which is on the other side. So um, I'm not going to worry too much about that belt right now. I think we have enough that we can uh, put it together and see if it will run a tape. Now what is a bit awkward is I can't eat uh, very quickly connect this to my monitor because there's no uh, video output on this yet. If I get it working it will be but at the moment there isn't so we'll have to connect it with an aerial cable but first let's see if it mechanically runs. Initially I'll run it without a tape and if that goes well then I'll put a tape in. And I need to fix that problem. Right, power cable. I run it on um, isolated mains. It takes a standard figure of eight cable, unlike the N1500, which uses an obscure connector. It's really hard to get. Right, first thing first will be whether the uh, clock comes on. So I'll just move it so you can see the clock here. If that comes on then the power supply is basically alive. Right, I'll switch it on just for a second. Oh, well that was weird. The clock didn't illuminate. Nothing happened until I switched it off. And then we had a bit of a spin from the... Um, which you couldn't see. We had a bit of a spin from the uh, real drive. Let's just do that again. Power up. Nothing. Power down. How odd. All right. I mean, I'm not going to worry if the clock's died. The clock's died. That's really not that important. But we may have a power supply fault. I've had power supply failure in one of these before. Um, it was... Uh, op amp I think on the board that we tilted out of the way just now so we will look at that in a moment first in this condition it should be possible to switch it on and get it to uh, attempt to lace unless of course it's just not working so it's just not working nothing so we do have power supply fault here Okay, well, you know, that's what we're here for. Let's fix it. Okay. All right, so it's powered down there. I do wish I could remember which I see it was. I had fail on one of these before. Right, so I need the service manual. And we can just test for some voltages. First thing I'm going to check is 12 volt line, which I should be able to pick up at plug 84 and various other places. But that's marked up, so we'll have that one. So I'm looking for 12 volt DC, and I think this is always on. So as soon as I switch on the power supply, I should get 12 volts. Sanity jack, because that just doesn't seem to be there. Yes, you can find it in another point place. Uh, P51. P51 here. Nothing. Well, fraction of a volt. That goes down to this IC, which is a UA723 op amp. And basically it comes out of pin 3. Pin 1 is not used, so it's... Pin 3, it's 1, not use 2, 3. This pin here. Make sure I've got good contact with that. And I've got a good ground point there. Nothing to speak of. Let's see what voltage is going into that IC. Uh, from the 2N3055, which is a nice big trans. When R113, it says, should be about 12 volts, 12.1 volts on both sides. More or less nothing. So is our 2N3055 working? 
Or is it not being switched on? It's driven by this op amp. There should be pin 10, should be about 13 volts. And it goes by our transistor T113. 113, so the base of 113 should be about 13 volts. Here's 113 here. NP, uh, PNP. About one volt. So let's go through the pins of this IC. I'm, I'm really blaming this IC at the moment. Pin one's not connected. Pin two should be about 12 volts. Much, nothing much there. It's hard to know exactly what's cause and effect on this IC. GS113 should have 26 volts on it, on the collector, TS113, collector. Should have 26 volts, 26 and a half volts. It's a bit high, but yes, that's there. Okay, it's in that area. Let's do some more work on that. All right, TS113, brain failure earlier. It is NPN, of course. And I think we'll do a in-circuit test here. It's all switched off, so uh, we should have a diode from base to collector. Yes, diode from base to emitter. Yes, no short between collector and emitter. Correct. Right, IC101 is looking very suspect, and I'm fairly sure that that's what's failed on one of these before, but do I have a spare? Almost certainly not. I'll have to order something in. That being the case, what I'll do, I think, is fit an IC socket in there, so it's easy to pop the new IC in when I get it. Uh, unless I have one from another machine, I don't really want to do that. I think I'd rather replace it with a new one. Okay, let's work on that. So, uh, I don't know if you can see what we're aiming to replace here. So, it's this I see here I'm pointing to. So, there's, they've got a resistor on one of the pins, which is just unhelpful. Let's zoom you in a little bit. So, this is the IC we're replacing. And that uh, there is a resistor which is soldered onto pin. Where would that be? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many pins has it got? Oh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's the output pin. And eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Yes, okay. So, uh, There is no resistor on the circuit diagram on pin 10, so that's obviously a bodge they've added. So here's my um, fairly cheap desolder system. I found this to be quite effective, it, you know, so it wasn't expensive. Um, I did have the first element fail uh, after only about a year, which is a little bit annoying, but it wasn't that hard to change. The, key thing to this thing, if you don't want it to get clagged up, is to make sure it's fully up to temperature before you start using it. That has lifted the trace, I think. Partly. You need to be a bit careful then. That's the one that came out. 
It's the one that's going in. Incredibly important to get it the right way around, of course. So pin one here is at the top. This PCB. Being a single sided PCB, there's no need to clean the top side. There's no flux or solder up there. That's inserted. The damage to that pad is limited. Oops. So I can, I don't have to repair the pad, I just have to make sure that the uh, contact is made properly. I'll check all that before I refit this salt, this uh, resistor to pin 10. I think we're ready for another switch on, see if we have a little bit more life out of it. What do you think? If we get something from the clock even, there'll be some evidence that we've made some progress. Clock. That's better. trying to play. Fast forward. Rewind. Mechanically seems to be all there. All right. Pop a tape in. See if it runs. Uh, I think that was a tape stall. Let's try that again. You hear the servos trying to hunt a little bit there. All right, good. Fast forward. Mm, nice. Stop, good, rewind. Play again. Okay, very well. Hmm. Good progress. Let's, uh, since I don't have uh, AV output, I'm going to have to connect it to an uh, aerial lead into that TV and try and tune it in. Let's see if that works. Excuse me a moment while I hook all that up. So what I'm going to have to do is put this uh, old TV into seek mode. Hmm. Should I use channel 17? It just seems appropriate somehow. Search. Right, we have a search thing. So let's switch the video recorder on and get it into play. And maybe it'll find something. Do I have to hold the button? I don't remember. No. That looks quite promising. Yes, that's some sort of picture. You start to damage the tape though. So yes, I need to store that. Stored, right. Looks like one head may be clogged. But that didn't seem to be the case, did it? When we looked earlier, the heads looked clean. Rewind it. Got some volume as well. I'm not getting any sound at the moment. But maybe that's because it hasn't got a stable picture. That seems to be mistracking badly.
Oh, we have sand. I just get the feeling that if I persevere a little bit, it might start working. Try tracking. Don't think it's going to do anything. I'll leave tracking central. I want to check, I think, that the tape isn't riding up or down anywhere. So let's swing the machine around. Let's swap some sort of view of the machine here. Because when I can see lines appearing, that's a sign that it may be starting to the tape is starting to weave. I could use a bit more light. Crunching noise is not coming from the back, it's coming from the pinch roller area. So maybe the pinch roller needs uh, a little work. Let's see if I can see it here. Probably you can't really see a lot because it all disappears into the cassette. But the fact it's making scrunching noises is a sign that the pinch roller, at the very least, needs um, a little bit of attention. And maybe the capstan could use a bit more cleaning. So let's do that. Power it down. So let's clean all this up a little bit more. Okay, it's... um. Not, I'm not sure it's that bad. I think it might respond to a little bit of glass paper just to take out that smooth bit. Let's do that. I have a a donor N1700 here. The heads may be okay, but I can't get them out for the moment because this is stuck down because I think the mechanism is in its uh, laced up condition. So I'm going to desolder one of these wires and then apply a power supply to the loading motor to get it to unlace. And let's see if I can just do that quickly. So I'm desoldering this so I don't end up stuffing a voltage down the um, drive circuit. Because even though this machine is scrap, I may still use the parts. I don't want to blow anything up. I uh, can't remember what voltage it requires, but I'm guessing about 12 volts. Let's start with about 9 And I don't know what the polarity should be, so we'll just have to uh, suck it and see. Right, which is the motor end? Well, that's the motor end. Maybe I need a little bit more than eight, eight or nine volts. Get a little bit more. Or maybe the mechanism's so jammed up that it won't unlace. I think that's a problem, actually. It's too jammed up. I'll just squirt some WD-40 in there because I'm not trying to fix this machine. Don't think I can get it to unlace. So it can be a bit hard to open this uh, cassette door. Oh, what a nuisance. Well, here's a scrap machine and it turns out that there is a way you can make it open even when it doesn't want to. You have to stick a screwdriver in and find a lever along the front here. It's all quite hard to see. But you can push on that lever which you can't see any better than I can, and sure enough, you can open it, even though the machine's still laced up. So now I can take the top off, now I can get to these heads. So I'm hoping these heads are in better condition than those. It says N1702. Right. Uh, something else from this scrap machine is, I'll show it to you later, the VCRLP logo from the top of the machine that was missing on this one. So if we get this one working, I'll put that logo on as well. Right, so we need to get these heads over from the scrapper, which seems to be mechanically all seized up. But I'm hoping it's um, an intact machine. So we're going to uh, open the bottom. This is all a bit awkward having it on my lap. 
but look, we don't have enough room in my workshop for two 1700s side by side. That's how you're supposed to take this piece off. There's that IC that had all the trouble with earlier on, and this one doesn't have that extra resistor in here. So here's the head drum. That's got completely the wrong kind of belt on it, or not on it. So I need to undo these grub screws with a Allen key, and then take that off, the head drum will pop out the other side. So here's the uh, head I've taken out of the scrap machine. I'm going to take a very close look at the head tips with my uh, little microscope. Make sure it's all intact. Okay, great care with this. So we need to take the head drum out of this machine. And now I'll show you that process. So there are two two millimeter grub screws here. But here's the thing. It's best not to take this pulley off. By the way, there's a bit of end float in it. it feels like about a millimeter or so of end float, so you need to keep that. So what I do here, undo these, or slacken off these grub screws. Right. Now, here's the trick here. I've got the new head ready to go on. And the old head ready to come off. But I, because I don't want to go into battle with this belt again, I'm going to slide the head out here. This is the bad one. Well, what we believe to be a bad head. I mean, let's not make any assumptions, but that's what I believe to be the bad head. And now slide the new one in. and straight onto the pulley. Right. Without having to go into battle with that awful drive belt again. Something else I've found uh, is best not to use the ball end of this when you're doing the final tightening or, or slackening of these rub screws because it will tend to slip even though I'm sure they're metric. Right, let's fill for end float. No end float. That's no good. Fine tweak. Just want to get that so there's a little bit of end float in there. That feels right. Now we can do these grub screws up. Right. That's the end float you can hear there. Of course, if it doesn't work, it could be because these heads are no good, or there's a different fault. But right now, it all feels like it should go. Oh. 
Oh dear. That head drama has come from a cold place. <laughs> that wasn't so clever. And it snatched the tape. So the heads may not be clean anymore. Well, let's hope they are. Oh, what a nuisance. Try again. Nothing at all? Have I forgotten something? Nothing at all. What gives? Ah. I didn't ask it to shut down, it shut down on its own. Alright, let's check those heads again. Make sure they're clean. They may have become contaminated. I'll power the machine down while I'm doing that. Let's check the continuity. I should have done this earlier, but I worry about checking continuity because there's a small risk that you could magnetise the heads very slightly. Uh, anyway, all I'll get is the back end of the transformer, so no, that won't tell me anything unless I desolder them, and I'm not about to do that. No, they're both going to read short, because you'll get the back end of the transformer. I don't know what to make of it. And then it's shutting down. Did it do that last time? And why is it doing that? Ah, I wasn't set up properly on here because of this missing component. Let's just um, fix that. I've got some bits off the scrap machine which I think I can bodge into place because these actuators work the switches on the servo board well mainly servo board here so let's um, try that okay that's fitted properly let's try it again
Oh. So that's looking like knackered heads. But at least the servos are running properly now. Oh dear. And maybe it won't keep shutting down. I'll just leave it playing in case the heads clean themselves up, but I don't think they will because they look fine. Now, looks like we've got more bad heads. Maybe I can find some more. Okay, I have uh, another 1700 head drum here. Let's check it with a microscope before I get too involved. Need some more light. You can never have enough light when it comes to checking video heads. Okay, well, heads are intact. Not incredibly clean, but good enough for now. So, we'll do this uh, whole process again, won't we? Okay, let's hold this pulley in place. Take away another set of suspect heads. And now fit the heads from another scrap machine. If this doesn't work, I'm probably done because I probably don't have any more heads. I'm a little worried because those heads are quite cold, but let's see how we get on. Ah, oh, what are we going to have then? Try the tracking. Oh, 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 oh. They may be cleaning up. Uh huh. That's not bad. Right, now I know the tracking's a little bit wayward on this tape, so let me now just go and swap this for another tape. Right, let's just try this tape. I think this is a better recording. Oh, that looks better, doesn't it? Swing the tracking from one side to the other. Right, so it loses it at the one end. Loses it somewhere near the other. Oh, it actually goes better again. So anyway, the tracking's fine. That looks pretty stable. Right. Nice. Let's just do some cosmetics now. I've found a VCR badge there from one of the scrap uh, N1700s and glued that on. Got a tiny bit bent in the process, but still, it's not bad. It's quite a thick piece of aluminium, actually. Now let's uh, refit this lid. Hmm. 
remember, I had a lot of trouble getting this off in the first place. Is it going to be just as hard to refit? Oh, before I do that, let me just tell you something. Let me tell you something. On the back of here, there's uh, aerial in and out, so there's a modulator in here, but there's no audio out and video out. Now, there is a line level audio signal in here, uh, which I can take out to a phono connector at the back, but there is not a normal line level video signal at the back here. There's something close, but it needs amplifying. So I need to build a circuit. I've built it for uh, 1502s and 1700s and even the SVC, SVR machine. Uh, I need to build another one of those circuits to put in here. And there's a couple of different variants, um, but I'll show you uh, later uh, what that circuit is. I'm not going to do that as part of this video. Let's call this a working machine and we'll come back to the... Um, video amplifier circuit another day because right now this is working so I'm quite pleased with that right let's refit this lid oh yeah the circuit when I build that what I'll do is I'll fit it underneath this board so let me just show you this powered down this board here signals board pops up sometimes there are a couple of screws on the circuit board but this one seems to be missing them a bit unnecessary anyway because the clips hold it pretty tight Oh, look what I've just found. I have just found the clip that's supposed to be in there. Aha. Uh -huh. So I can take my little bodge out and fit that properly in there. That's supposed to hold that PCB in place. Well, that was a bit of luck. So, under here, there's uh, plenty of space to put a video amplifier and drill out one of these sockets at the back or drill out two of those sockets at the back to fit audio and video connectors at the back and typically I'd put audio would be phono and, and BNC for video. So that's what I'll do when I build the video amplifier board but I don't have a spare one to hand. So let's just pop that back into place. So let's just take a moment to admire this beautiful machine in full working order. Well, I think that's come out really well in the end. I'm very pleased with that and I hope you've enjoyed it too. So please do remember to like, share and especially subscribe and I'll do more content on audio and video technology in the future. Bye for now.